it's an honor to be here for the third year in a row, taking another shot on goal for the uh, Q2B team. And the first uh, Q2B talk that I gave two years ago, I suggested that we use the word NISC, Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum, to describe the near-term quantum platforms that are being developed, and I wrote up that talk, and my views haven't changed a whole lot since then. But there are some recent developments which are worthwhile to acknowledge. You might have heard about this paper, which was published seven weeks ago now. Now, the idea of quantum supremacy is that we have good reason to think that it's not possible, in all cases, for quantum systems to efficiently simulate what, for classical systems to efficiently simulate what quantum systems do. Arguably, that's about the most interesting thing that's ever been said about the difference between quantum and classical, and so there's a strong incentive to try to verify in the laboratory that that's really true. The announcement of quantum supremacy stirred a lot of interest, not surprisingly. Far be it from me to make fun of anyone who has a lot more Twitter followers than I do. But I think it's safe to say that some of their reactions were more credible than others. <laughs> if you read the Google paper, and I hope you will, because it's very well written and quite accessible, you'll learn that they built a device called Sycamore with transmon superconducting qubits laid out in a two-dimensional array and with other transmons serving as the couplers connecting together nearest neighbors in that array. Those inductors, or those couplers, which are capacitively coupled, can be turned off very firmly, which is important for reducing crosstalk, and also turned off and on very rapidly, and that was an important technical advance. The Sycamore device had 53 working qubits in that two-dimensional array, and they were able to demonstrate that they could perform two qubit entangling gates with an error rate per gate of 0.6%, even when all the qubits were operating in parallel and performed those gates in 12 nanoseconds. And for the largest circuit that they executed, which had 432 qubit gates, they achieved a circuit fidelity of about 0.2%. So what one can do is with fixed two qubit gates in a circuit, randomize the single qubit gates, and then choose such a circuit and execute it millions of times each time measuring all the qubits to generate a 53-bit string. And those bit strings are sampling from a probability distribution which is not uniformly random on all 53-bit strings. And one can then, with the classical computation, with the circuit slightly modified to make that classical computation easier, verify heavy output generation, that is, that the more likely strings really are being generated by the device with higher probability to validate that circuit fidelity. And because this random circuit has no special structure that's easy to exploit, and because the Hilbert space dimension is exponentially large in the number of qubits, it's very hard for a classical computer to simulate what the quantum computer is doing. And while the Sycamore device can generate uh, millions of samples from that distribution in just minutes, for a classical supercomputer to perform a comparable task would take at least days and perhaps longer. So that experimentally verifies that the hardware is working the way we expect, producing meaningful results in a regime where it seems classical simulation is very difficult. The significance of this is that, first of all, it's an impressive achievement in experimental physics and an indication of how quantum hardware is advancing. Arguably, we have now entered the regime where the extravagant exponential resources of the quantum world can really be validated. This isn't really a surprise, but still it's a milestone worthy of note. It seems that building a quantum computer, although it's really, really hard, is not ridiculously hard. Now that the hardware is working, we can start seriously seeking real applications. And you can see other takes on the achievement of quantum supremacy in some of these publications I've listed here. So what happens next? 
Well, what we'd all very much like to see are real applications that have a practical impact on the world, and it's important to discover such applications because that will stimulate further interest and investment, which will be necessary for the technology to continue to advance. We can also expect to see in the not-too-distant future dramatic improvements in storage times of logical qubits using quantum error correction and hope for continuing advances in two-qubit gate fidelities enabling us to execute larger and larger quantum circuits. And in short, in various platforms, we'd like to see more qubits and better gates. So we've entered the NISC era, the era of noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. Intermediate scale, meaning these are now large enough so that we can't, by brute force, easily simulate what the quantum computer is doing, even with a powerful classical supercomputer. Noisy emphasizes that these devices aren't error corrected and the noise limits their computational power. For physicists, NISC is an exciting advance. It gives us a new tool for exploring the properties of highly entangled systems of many particles in a regime which was never experimentally accessible before. And it may have practical applications as well, but we're not really sure about that. We shouldn't think of NISC, which is something that's going to change the world by itself. Instead, it's a step towards the more powerful quantum technologies we're hoping to develop in the future. I think we can be confident that quantum technology will have a transformative impact on the world eventually, but we're not sure how long that's going to take. So how should we find these applications? Well, one approach is to follow Scott's advice. When he said, instead of thinking of a hard problem and asking how to speed it up, we could ask, what are quantum computers good at, and build our application from that. And his specific suggestion was certified random number generation. So if we access what are putatively random numbers on the cloud, how can we be sure that they're really random? Well, one idea is that a client who wants that randomness can create a random quantum circuit and demand that the server execute it rapidly, so rapidly that no classical computer masquerading as a quantum computer could do it, and return the results. Now, we know that random quantum circuits generate a lot of entropy, and then with classical methods, we can distill that entropy to nearly uniform randomness. And the key is that if the results are returned so quickly, it couldn't have been done by a classical computer, and then at his leisure, the client can verify the heavy output generation to see that the quantum circuit really was executed. And there are a lot of interesting open questions about how to take this idea further, which I won't go into. Now, there is an emerging paradigm for how we might make use of near-term quantum devices, a kind of hybrid quantum classical scheme. It makes sense to make use of the power of our classical computers and use the quantum computer as a kind of coprocessor. And that might work this way. We can execute a relatively low-depth quantum circuit, measure all the qubits, and then send the results of those measurements to a classical computer, which returns instructions about how to slightly modify the quantum circuit. And that cycle can then be iterated with the goal of minimizing some cost function for the purpose of approximately solving an optimization problem. Now, we don't really expect quantum computers to be able to give us exact solutions in polynomial time to hard instances of NP hard problems, but they might be able to produce better approximate solutions or to find approximate solutions faster. When that scheme is applied to classical optimization problems, we usually call it QAOA, Quantum Approximate Optimization Algorithm. But it can also be applied to problems that physicists and chemists are interested in, namely finding properties of the low energy states of some quantum many body system. So should we expect that these hybrid quantum classical uh, schemes will be able to give us speed ups for solving optimization and quantum problems relative to the best classical methods we have for solving these problems? Well, we don't really know. We have to try it and see how well it works. But it's really a lot to ask, because these classical methods are well honed after decades of development. And 
the quantum methods are just becoming available now for the first time. One of the things that can cause concern is that the classical optimization side of this loop can be quite computationally demanding, especially if we need many variational parameters as the instance of the problem that we want to size, uh, that uh, we want to solve grows in size. A uh, ray of hope offered by these authors that there is some evidence that if we solve the hard problem of optimizing the classical parameters for a particular instance of a problem we're interested in solving, then those same classical parameters will provide a good starting point for solving other instances, which would reduce the classical computational load for doing QAOA. But the truth is that we don't have very good theoretical arguments why low-depth quantum circuits will have an advantage compared to classical methods for solving optimization. Now, that needn't discourage us too much. We're accustomed in classical computing to having algorithms which are effective in practice where theorists were not able to validate the performance in advance. A very relevant current example is deep learning, which is having a big practical impact even though theorists still lack an understanding of why, for many applications, deep learning networks can be efficiently trained. And so we'll be in an era of quantum heuristics, where we'll have a number of heuristic algorithms, like approximate optimizers, quantum annealers, and so on, where we don't have good theoretical arguments about their performance, but we'll try them, and hopefully as we experiment with those algorithms, we'll be able to make them better. But still, it's going to be quite challenging with relatively small quantum circuits that we'll have access to in the next few years to find real applications. Uh, we might have to get lucky. But what can facilitate progress are meetings like this one, where the application users communicate with the quantum computing experts. Naturally, there's a lot of interest in the potential of quantum machine learning. It might be the case that a quantum deep learning network would have an advantage over classical deep learning for some applications, but we don't really know that's true. We're just going to have to try it and see how well it works. Part of the reason for the interest in quantum machine learning is the idea we call QRAM, quantum random access memory. That means we can take a lot of classical data, a very long classical vector, and encode it very succinctly in just log n qubits a potential advantage, but many of the proposed quantum machine learning applications are hampered by input-output bottlenecks. That is, it can take a lot of time to load classical data into QRAM, which can nullify the potential quantum advantage. And what we get as an output is a quantum state succinctly encoded, and we can only get a modest amount of information per shot when we measure that state. So in order to characterize the output in more detail, we would have to run the routine many times in succession. It might be more natural to think of quantum machine learning as a task where the input and the output are quantum, applying it to something like recognizing exotic quantum phases of matter or finding better ways to control quantum systems. It makes sense that if there's going to be a quantum advantage for learning some probability distribution, that advantage will occur when quantum entanglement somehow underlies the probability distribution in question. Now, when I spoke at Q2B two years ago, I was excited about a recently discovered algorithm by Karanidis and Prakash, a quantum algorithm for the problem of recommendation systems. That's the problem which is solved, for example, by Netflix and Amazon, where a customer reveals a few of the products that she likes, and then a recommendation is made for other products that she's uh, likely to uh, prefer. Uh, the reason this works is that there's a big preference matrix that describes the users and the products, and that has a relatively low rank because there aren't that many different kinds of users. Now, what Karanidis and Prakash pointed out is that once we've set up the right kind of data structure, there's a quantum algorithm for making a high-value recommendation which has a runtime which is just polylog in the size of the preference matrix. That seemed like a notable speed-up for a quantum application that could have a real impact. But just a few months after I gave the talk, an uh, amazing 
student then at the University of Texas working with a quantum computing superhero, uh, Ewen Tang, uh, made a remarkable discovery. She found that there are quantum-inspired classical algorithms that can achieve a similar result for the recommendation systems problem. It's intrinsic to the recommendation system problem that the matrix in question is low rank, and that can be exploited in classical sampling algorithms, uh, Ewan pointed out, to make a high value recommendation, again, in a time which is just polylog in the size of the matrix. And that gave rise to a flood of other dequantization results for proposed applications of quantum algorithms to various tasks, some of which I listed here. Now, these quantum-inspired classical sampling algorithms are a notable theoretical advance in classical algorithms. It's kind of remarkable that we can succeed in, with a complexity, which is just polylog in the size of a very large matrix, in the regime where it has a low rank. The practical impact of these discoveries is still unclear. These classical methods don't scale very well with the rank of the matrix or with the error that we're trying to achieve. There's still an advantage, so far as we know, for doing linear algebra with quantum computers, not in the low rank regime, but in the regime of high rank matrices, which are sparse. And exactly what the practical implications of that really haven't been worked out satisfactorily for real end-to-end -end application. So that's an important thing to address. Now, we're not going to be able to do linear algebra solving uh, matrix inversion, for example, with quantum computers, most likely, using NIST devices. Those algorithms are just too demanding. For solving those and other hard problems, we're probably going to need scalable quantum computers using quantum error correction to achieve fault tolerance against the noise that afflicts quantum devices. In principle, quantum error correction can work as long as the noise is sufficiently weak and is not too strongly correlated among the qubits, as long as we can perform operations in parallel and frequently refresh the qubits. Theoretically, the overhead cost of doing quantum error correction does not scale too badly. If I want to perform an ideal quantum circuit with T gates, then once the noise is below a threshold of accuracy, once our quantum gates are sufficiently accurate, then we can execute with uh, good reliability that ideal circuit using our noisy gates with a multiplicative overhead factor, which is just polylog and the size of the ideal computation. But in practice, the numbers are not so nice. So according to one recent estimate, if we wanted to break the RSA crypto system, um, which requires just a few thousand very well-protected logical qubits, and we have a two qubit gate error rate of 10 to the minus three, somewhat better than the current state of the art, we need 20 million physical qubits. So to reach that scalable regime, we're going to have to cross a quite daunting chasm from where we're likely to be in the next couple of years with hundreds of physical qubits to millions of physical qubits, and that's probably going to take some time. Now, for now, the best uh, idea we have for achieving scalability with quantum error correction is based on what's called the surface code. It has the advantage that it can tolerate a relatively high error rate, and it requires only geometrically local processing in a two-dimensional array. It may be that there will be better methods, particularly as the gate error rates continue to improve, or as we have devices with higher connectivity, so we're not necessarily limited to geometrically local gates. And there's really a theoretical opportunity for finding better methods of doing fault tolerance when we do have higher connectivity in a many qubit device. We'll have the opportunity in the relatively near term to learn better how to customize fault tolerance to the properties of the noise in a particular platform and for the particular algorithms that we want to run. And it's going to be important in the near term when we won't be able to do full-blown quantum error correction to find other ways of mitigating noise. So for example, in the kinds of quantum simulation problems that physicists and chemists are interested in, there is some natural noise resistance in many of the problems that we 
want to solve, and that can be used to our advantage. Now, before we have quantum error correction, in order to execute larger circuits, presumably we're going to need better gate error rates. And you can tell a kind of optimistic story about that, which goes like this. Suppose we believe that the gate error rates will improve exponentially in time, at least for a while. And that means that the volume of quantum circuits that we can execute with sufficient reliability will grow exponentially with time. But roughly speaking, the classical cost of simulating that quantum circuit with a classical computer grows exponentially with the volume. And so if you believe all that, that would mean that the classical cost of simulating the state-of-the-art quantum computers will increase doubly exponentially with the time so that we can make rapid progress. But the catch is that substantially improving the two qubit gate fidelities is really hard, and it's arguable whether we're really making progress that fast. It should be an important goal to continue to think about how to make big steps forward in gate error rates. One approach to doing that is topological quantum computing, where the error correction is built in at the physical level by making use of a suitable quantum material. It's a very visionary idea based on quite beautiful physics, but challenging to carry out. There are other ideas which people are starting to explore more seriously. In the case of superconducting qubits, the basic design of the transmon hasn't changed very much for the last 12 years. There may be alternative qubit designs which will have advantages in the long run by being better protected against decoherence and potentially allowing better gate error rates like the zero pi qubit, which was recently demonstrated. And in the case of platforms that make use of bosonic modes of various kinds like uh, microwave resonators and superconducting circuits or uh, photonic modes and photonic devices or the motional states of ion traps, we can take advantage of ideas for encoding information in those continuous variable systems to have some intrinsic protection against noise. And it's important to continue to develop other platforms that could potentially leap ahead in reliability. It's notable that there's been big improvements in just the last couple of years in quantum devices making use of trapped neutral atoms and spin qubits. The idea of these GKP codes for continuous variable systems is that we can create states which have a kind of grid structure in phase space which provides some intrinsic protection against errors which slightly shift the state in phase space. The idea of the zero pi qubit is that we can build a superconducting quantum circuit which has the property that the energy in the device as a function of the change in superconducting phase across the circuit has two minima corresponding to two computationally basis states separated by a large barrier which protects against bit flips. But we're also the degeneracy of the minima is well protected against fluctuations in circuit parameters because of the way the circuit is designed. And in the case of topological quantum computing, well, we hope to see in the not too distant future actual logic perform quantum gates by turning off and on couplings between quantum wires which have Majorana modes at their endpoints. When that happens, if it happens, it'll be a real milestone for physics, let alone what it might imply about future technology. Part of what makes these things so hard, particularly in the arena of solid state devices like topological quantum computing, is that progress hinges on advances in materials, and they, those take a lot of time and, advance and uh, investment. Materials isn't the whole story. Um, of course, we need better ideas, too, in order to make big leaps forward in device performance. Now, as a physicist, you know, what I find exciting is that we now have a tool for exploring physics, which we never had access to before, for decades, as we've wanted to understand the structure of matter at shorter and shorter distances, we built more powerful particle accelerators. Or if we wanted to understand the universe close to the Big Bang, we've built more powerful instruments and telescopes. And now, as we want to understand more deeply the properties of very highly entangled states of matter, 
we are going to build more powerful quantum computers and quantum simulators. So what's exciting to a physicist is that we expect that with a quantum computer we can simulate efficiently any process that occurs in nature. That's not true of classical computers, which we think are not capable of simulating very highly entangled systems. And that means we'd be able to probe more deeply into the properties of exotic molecules and materials, or complex molecules and exotic materials, and also explore fundamental physics in new ways, for example, simulating the quantum behavior of a black hole or the universe right after the Big Bang. And in the long run, I think we can expect the implications of that capability of simulating complex quantum systems will have very profound implications for science and technology, just the applications to chemistry are likely to open new avenues in human health, energy production, sustainability of the planet, and so on. In the near term, we have opportunities to learn more about how quantum systems evolve in time. Simulating the dynamics of highly entangled systems is very hard to do with classical computers. We'll be able to do that with quantum computers and simulators. We expect them to have a big advantage in that arena, and physicists are hoping we can learn a lot about quantum dynamics using NIST devices. Fifty years ago, we gained a lot of insight into the properties of chaos in nonlinear classical systems, that is, sensitivity to initial conditions, that progress was achieved by simulating those systems using digital computers. And now we understand comparatively little about the properties of quantum chaos because we haven't been able to simulate it until now. But now we can make progress on that using quantum simulation. That can be done either with circuit-based, universal quantum computers, digital quantum computers, or with analog devices with interactions uh, among the qubits which we can tune. Both of those approaches are important to pursue. They have complementary pros and cons. But in both cases of analog and digital quantum simulation, we should really have the goal of laying foundations for the more revealing simulations that we expect to be able to do in the future with fault-tolerant devices. And that applies, I think, to NISC applications more broadly. I've been interested in quantum gravity my whole career. And it's often said, with some justice, that quantum gravity is a subject which is inaccessible to experiment. And that's based on the observation that if I want to probe the quantum structure of space-time, I need to probe exceedingly short distances. And for that, I need correspondingly high energies. But what we've been learning is that the quantum geometry of space can be viewed as a kind of emergent property of highly entangled systems, which we can hope to explore even with relatively near-term quantum platforms. And the flip side of that is that we hope and expect that intuition about gravity and how it behaves can help us to understand better the mysterious properties of very complex, highly entangled systems of many particles. But in this, as in all the things we're trying to do, we need to always bear in mind, as has been said, that quantum computing is a marathon, not a sprint. There are very tempting goals to reach for, but we have to be realistic about time scales. So let me sum up my main points. Demonstrations of quantum supremacy seem to be confirming the extravagant computational resources provided by the quantum world. We are entering the NISC era, and we will be able to explore heuristic quantum algorithms. It may be that we'll find useful applications, but we can't guarantee it. It's important to continue to strive for lower quantum gate error rates, because that will enable us to execute larger circuits and potentially find applications that would otherwise be out of reach. And those improvements will also eventually lower the overhead cost of doing quantum error correction. The discovery of dequantization using quantum-inspired classical algorithms is a noteworthy advance in our understanding of classical algorithms, but its practical applications are still unclear, as are the practical implications of being able to speed up linear algebra with quantum computers. 
The quantum dynamics of highly entangled systems is particularly hard to simulate with classical computers and therefore it's an especially promising arena for achieving a quantum advantage. And we shouldn't expect NIST to change the world by itself. Realistically, our goal for near-term quantum platforms should be to pave the way for bigger payoffs that we hope to achieve in the future. I think we have reason to be optimistic about quantum technology having a transformative effect on society eventually, but that may take decades of hard work and investment. And if we put that effort in, I'm confident we're going to be amply rewarded. Thanks very much for listening. So I guess we're taking a few questions. Hi, John. That was a very Hi. nice talk. Thank you. So question, when we think about dequantizing quantum algorithms, which general spaces of quantum algorithms do you think we should look in for mining them for dequantization? Right? We've got a lot of machine learning type stuff, but are there other application areas we could be looking at as well? So I think the question is, I spoke of dequantization, and in particular, I had a list of applications which included many uh, quantum machine learning proposals, but should we be looking more broadly at dequantizing other types of applications? Of course we should. I mean, it's, uh, this is a uh, struggle to, with quantum technology, do things that we couldn't do with classical devices. So an important part of that is coming up with quantum algorithms and interesting applications for quantum computing. But every time we do so, we have to think very hard about whether there are better ways than those that are currently known, or we should assess the currently known methods for doing that with classical computers. So I think the issue of can we dequantize a quantum algorithm is uh, it's a very broad issue that we should always have in mind.